Hi. Um, thanks very much for everyone who submitted questions for our Instagram Live. Uh, my name's Oliver Barnett. I run the London Clinic of Nutrition, and I'll just rifle through those questions now for everyone's benefit. Um, the first question is, what is the most efficient way of curing a flare-up if you suffer from ulcerative colitis? Well, ultimately, if you're getting flares of ulcerative colitis, which is a chronic condition, you want to deal with the chronicity of it so you don't get acute flares. However, if you are having a flare, aloe vera juice can work really, really well. Um, also, I tend to find that linseed tea, like linseeds boiled in water, as they work well for also gallbladder flares, would also work well for um, ulcerative colitis flares as well. Also, high doses of boswellia um, and slippery elm would work as well as a powdered formula. So getting up to about three or four uh, teaspoons of boswellia and slippery elm bark powder stirred briskly in water. You could also combine that with some marshmallow root powder as well, um, which could be very useful. So that's some ideas, but, but the most important thing really is, is dealing with the chronic underlying causes of ulcerative colitis being a, a, an autoimmune inflammatory condition in the first place. And an idea might be booking a, an appointment with a functional medicine practitioner or one of the integrated therapists in our team. Um, leading on talking about gallbladder, someone's asked, I have no gallbladder and taking digestive enzymes, will this make it worse? Any other tips? I tend to find that most patients who have their gallbladder removed within four to five years will have some element of digestive issue. Gallbladder has a function in spitting out bile. Bile is really good for emulsifying fats, but it's also really good in helping with detoxification, especially for things like heavy metals and other sorts of toxins. So yes, digestive enzymes could be useful. Um, I don't see that as making it, the situation worse, um, but I find a lot of people with gallbladder issues do tend to benefit from bile acid supplementation or even pancreatic enzymes. Um, question is, what is, the leak, what is leaky gut syndrome and symptoms and how could this relate to bread and gluten? That's in, um, gluten, that is, sorry. Um, well, leaky gut syndrome is when um, small particles um, pass through the gut lining. The gut lining only tends to be a few cells thick, and over, but it does tend to regenerate itself very, very quickly. If you imagine the gut lining a bit like a cheesecloth that has, that has sort of um, um, holes in it, and you get these sort of micro fractures. But over time, if you keep having a insult to the gut lining, that gut lining, the, the cheesecloth, let's say, won't regenerate itself. And you then end up with what's known as um, antigenic intestinal permeability, which is a quite a severe form of, le of leaky gut. And gluten um, and grains can worsen that situation. Um, there was a study done a few years ago with uh, Alessio Fasano and, and, and Halland, where they, they took, um, you know, control groups and also um, um, non-control groups and looked at what happened to people each time they ate gluten in terms of the, um, the gut barrier. And they found that even in the control groups, it caused uh, microfractures in the gut lining, which basically suggests that every time anyone eats gluten, you're causing problems with the gut lining, not just if you already have, um, if, you're, if you're susceptible, that is. Um, does clearing SIBO also cure leaky gut? Um, I think that there's a lot of fashion, it's very fashionable SIBO for lately. Um, I think SIBO is a consequence of leaky gut uh, rather than the other way around. Um, SIBO, you know, the term SIBO didn't really exist much sort of 10 years or so ago, and we were probably just treating patients with SIBO unwittingly or unknowingly and looking at the small intestine. So I actually think if you improve digestion and you improve gut barrier function and gut immunology, you will tend to improve SIBO, not the other way around. That's my take on it anyway. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm right. It's just, my, it's just my, my, my opinion and the way I, I, I treat patients. Um, how do you know the state of your gut health? Well, uh, that's a good question. You can do a stool test, and there's, there's a whole myriad of stool tests available out there on the market to look at your gut health. Um, and that, those stool tests will not only just look at the bacteria and the good guys and the bad guys, but they'll also give you functional gut markers, um, such as inflammation markers or infection markers. Um, you could arrange those stool tests through the clinic if you'd like. Um, you could, uh, yeah, your sub question is, I think my Crohn's was caused by antibiotics. Could this be the case? Yeah, Crohn's disease can, could well be um, antibiotic induced. That is possible because antibiotics will affect um, uh, gut immunity and then in turn cause autoimmunity. So yes, the answer is it could be the case. And again, we do have a specialist in the team who only or primarily works in inflammatory bowel disease cases, such as microscopic colitis, colitis, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. 
So if you did want to get some help in that area, you could ask to get in touch with uh, Nishta in the team um, for treatment at the clinic. Another question on the gut is how to improve the microbiome. Thoughts on fecal microbial transplant? Um, FMT can be useful for some people. Most of the research is in eradication of Clostridium difficile, which is a nasty little uh, 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 critter. And people get locked in vicious cycles of taking antibiotics to get rid of it. And then the problem is that affects the microbiome more, so they continue taking more antibiotics to get rid of, get rid of C. diff, and they get rid of stuck in this awful cycle. So often it has, in terms of the research in, in PubMed and what have you, the best research is there around, with FMT, around um, C. diff. But there are people who have long-term IBS and other gut-related conditions who have benefited from FMT. Conversely, there are some anecdotal reports of putting someone else's microbiome into yourself of unusual things happening, like someone who never liked beer previously. There are case reports of them that suddenly having a massive craving, cravings of beer thereafter, after they had someone else's microbiome. Or even with weight, some people have ballooned in weight after having fecal microbial transplants because your gut environment tends to dictate have a lot a big influence on your on your on your body weight. Um, so at the moment the jury's out in terms of other you know other um, um, conditions where it may be helpful, but I say the, the research is within um, uh, Clostridium difficile, but there is more and more research appearing um, quite regularly um, with FMT. Um, have you seen IBS or IBD patients get better with improving their gut health through probiotics alone? Um, well, I'd really just give someone probiotics on their own for an IBD patient, maybe for an IBS patient, but normally it'd be in conjunction with a full assessment and treatment program around for diet and supplementation, herbal medicine and lifestyle. So I wouldn't normally do that on its own. Um, what is the amount of probiotics needed to be taken daily to gain the biggest, so the highest benefit? Well, it's not really the amount that's important, it's more the, the species and the strains that are important. Obviously, you hear a lot of the time we'll take a very high strength probiotic and take 20 billion and 50 billion organisms, but there are pr products on the market which are even under 1 billion, which in some patients get very good results at much lower levels. So it is very much species and strain dependent. Um, based on the condition. And again, if people want to get more information about what strains and what species are better for which conditions, there's a, I think there's a website called Probiotics Advisor they can have a look at, and that's got really good um, um, uh, references and research on there. I'll just um, say here as well, we have actually got an article on our website as well, which looks at the different probiotic strains. Brilliant. So people can head over there. Perfect. Um, do you recommend any particular probiotics? Well, again, that feeds in from the previous question. It's quite condition, species, strain dependent. Um, the most biggest selling probiotic in the UK at the moment is called a Megaspore, which is a spore-based probiotic. Um, that has quite, can have quite good effects in improving uh, immunomodulating with the gut environment. It can be very, very useful, and many people do find a benefit from that. Um, I guess it's the biggest selling probiotic uh, at the moment well, partly because of their marketing machine, you know, they have quite a lot of education-based marketing, but I guess, but it is a, a an effective um, probiotic. Um, I tend to recommend um, Megaspore, I, I, and again, really, I, I quite like Gut Pro, which is quite a hypoallergenic formula for patients who've got, who react to a lot of stuff. Also for babies, it's very nice. Um, what else do I like? Uh, I like the ones from Seeking Health. Um, they're, they're pretty good. And they're the company that makes for probiotics for Seeking Health. Oh, the name escapes me, but um, it's a very, they have them made by a particular company, I can't remember the name, who are incredibly good. And the quite a popular one with Seeking Health is the histamine probiotic um, for patients who are having problems with high histamine. Um, what is the reason for severe heartburn? Well, there can be a number of reasons for heartburn. Um, but a lot of the time it is food related. So there are particular triggers like coffee, gluten, uh, chilies. Um, again, histamine based foods can contribute to, to heartburn. Dairy can be a problem. Um, eating stressed or can, is a very easy way to heartburn. Uh, heartburn is often caused, people say, by, by stomach acid, but a lot of the time it, it's counterproductive taking antacids because stomach acid serves to ward off microbes, help you um, digest a lot of your nutrients and digest your protein and, protein and fats. So you be, a lot of the time it's bile acid issues rather than stomach acid issues. So I'd be wary of taking medication that, that 
deplete stomach acid for the reasons I've just mentioned with heartburn. Uh, licorice capsules and tablets, um, chewable ones are very good for heartburn. You can buy those online. Um, how long does it take to restore gut flora after antibiotic use? Ah, that's a difficult question to answer because do you really, do we ever really restore gut flora? That's, that's the question. And I think that probiotics are transient. They don't really remain in the gut and you have to keep taking them. So restoring the damage done by antibiotic use, yes, you can get people better again, but actually getting back to the numbers or the species that you had previously one after supplementation, that's the jury's out in the current debate basically is that the probiotics are transient. So do you actually get, do you restore it long term? I think the answer is no. Um, can a cup of tea with milk cause bloating? Yes. Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, anything can cause bloating, but obviously milk um, is what is the second biggest food sensitivity after dairy, after gluten, sorry. So yes, there's a very high chance that having tea with milk could do that. Obviously you could use an alternative like oat milk or the barista version or almond milk. Uh, you may find that that doesn't have, that have the same effect. Um, the question is, how do you test for candida overgrowth? Uh, candida overgrowth can be measured in so many different ways. You can measure it in organic acids in the urine, you can measure it in the stool, um, and you can also measure it in saliva, in antibodies. Um, so those, and also you can measure it in blood antibodies. So if you're being really super comprehensive, you do blood, saliva, organic acids, and a stool test, it'd be very expensive, but that'd be the most comprehensive way of doing it. I think personally, if I had to pick any method, I'd probably use organic acids. I think it gives you the best bang for your buck. Um, again, Cambridge Nutritional Sciences do a um, candida antibody test as a blood spot test, I think, for about 65 quid. That's pretty good. If you get IgG, IgM, and IgA. But also from a candida perspective, as a, as a practitioner, and clinician, it's quite obvious when someone's got candida from a physical from a physical perspective, looking at the eyes and iridology, looking at the tongue, looking at the nails, uh, also looking at the patient's some sort of eating habits in terms of like sugary cravings and things like that. It's pretty obvious from um, a consult whether there's issues with candida rather than then testing specifically. Um, last question on here was, how much liquid apple cider vinegar with mother per day is too much? Ha! Well, I don't really know, because I've never done enough to take too much to know, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with a tablespoon or two in water. I have no idea what sort of levels this particular person was asking about. So I have no idea how much is too much. So sorry, I haven't got a proper answer for that. So thank you very much for listening to all the questions. Much obliged.